thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you because of the unbreakable covenant you have made with us. That if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, heaven will be ours at last. That you've gone to prepare a place for us. When you come, you are coming back. And the sky is our goal, not the grave. And we know that when you come, 
by your grace, by your power, by your love, by your spirit, will be ready, looking for you, waiting for you. Lord, we're asking for that day, get us ready. Yeah. And we also pray that as many people as possible in our churches and from outside our churches, you'll grant us the grace and the enablement to do our part. Get them ready for that coming of the Lord. Yeah. Use us, Lord, in the lives of other people. Yeah. Let, O oh Lord, your work prosper in our hands. Yeah. In Jesus' name I pray. Yeah. Abide in me, and I in you. Abide in me, and I in you. You know, many times we tell people that Christ should abide in us, but how? His word abiding in us. His love abiding in us. His wisdom abiding in us. His kindness, His goodness abiding in us. He abiding in us in all His qualities, in all His power. That's He abiding in us. And then He says, You abide in me also. How do we abide in Him? By we abiding in His word, in His love. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Except it abide in the vine. You know, it's possible for us to leave this conference and then go out and then come back the next time and say, well, I, I didn't bear any fruit. And you told us that we will bear fruit. You gave us all these, um, all these lectures and lessons and readings and exposures. And you said that this now is in your hand. Go out and you'll bear fruit. And now here we are, there is no fruit at all. My church has not increased. My church has not grown. And then you will think that the fault is on us. Jesus was telling them, I've given you power over all the power of the enemy. And this work is going to be done through you. And it was going away. And he knew that if any of them did not bear fruit, they're likely to say, it's his fault. Maybe he did not give us enough ideas. It's not just idea. Maybe he did not follow us through. Maybe that's the problem. Not just that. He said, with all I have taught you for three and a half years, with all that you have seen for three and a half years, with all that you are partaking of for three and a half years, Except you abide in me, you cannot bear fruit. And as we're going out, if we do not abide in him, in his word, in his love, and walk in the steps of Christ, and live the life of Christ, we cannot bear fruit. The ideas alone, the strategies alone, the lectures alone, the sharing alone, the fellowship alone cannot make us to bear the fruit, but we abide in him. Think of a wife that says, I want to have children. I want to have children. And she never stays at home. From the market to the supermarket, from the supermarket to the farm, from the farm to her relatives, from her relatives to overseas, from the overseas to the village, from the village. The only place she doesn't touch, she doesn't stay, she doesn't sleep is in the husband's house. And she wants to have children. And think of the pastor that doesn't abide in Christ, doesn't abide in the word, doesn't abide in the work, doesn't actually stay home, get the work done, and abide in the life of Christ. And he says, I've got these big ideas from the church growth conference. I'm going out, I'm going to bear fruit. Abide in me, and I in you. Except, except the branch abides in the vine, it cannot bear fruit. And no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. 
you know the mistake we make sometimes is that everything depends on God. If our churches are going to grow, that's God's business. If many souls are going to be saved, that's God's business. In fact, we say that only Jesus saves. Yes, only Jesus saves, but Jesus never saves alone. Without the preacher, how shall they believe if they have not heard? How will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach if they have not been sent? But how will we hear if the preachers that are sent never go where they are sent? Only Jesus can save, but Jesus doesn't save alone. Without the preaching of the gospel, he has so appointed that through the foolishness of the preaching, men and women will be saved and brought into the kingdom. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Verse 7, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you. And my words abide in you. You know, many times uh, Satan's words abide in us will never bear fruit. Satan's words abiding in us. And Satan's words many times abide in many, many preachers. Or Satan's word. Those people in those areas will never be saved. No matter how long you preach, how hard you pray, how long you fast. That's Satan's word. God doesn't know any impossibility. That stage is so predominantly of this particular religion, and it is impossible to have a large church in that place. That's Satan's word. If that is the thing that is abiding in you, you cannot bear fruit. If my words abide in you, that minister never went to college and because he never went to college he cannot speak english he cannot use all the ppps and all the sss that the preachers at the conference used because he didn't go to school the holy ghost cannot use him he can only use university graduates that's satan's word and as long as satan word satan's words abide in you that's what you meditate on and say that I cannot do this because I'm not like so and so. I cannot do this because I didn't go to university. I cannot do this because I didn't go to college. As long as Satan's word abides in you, you cannot be approached. Now, other people have come back and they have said, We've been to the land, we've seen everything. It is true, the land is flowing with milk and honey, but we got there. Those people are giants. We felt were so small as grasshoppers. And so, they can do it. We cannot do it. Those people, their music, their ushers, their people, their buildings, let them do it. God has called them. As for me, I feel like a grasshopper. That's not the word of Christ abiding in us. That's the word of unbelief abiding in me, if I have that attitude. And if the words of men and the words of Satan abide in me, I cannot bear fruit. Ye abide in me and let my words abide in you. What are the words of Christ? With God, all things are possible. Anywhere, anytime, by whosoever he chooses. That's the word of Christ abiding in me. If he believe in me, the works that I do, ye shall do. And greater works than these shall ye do, because I go to the Father. 
That's Christ's word abiding in me. And I do not know any limitation, any fear, any doubt, because his word has not limited me. Therefore, anything that limits me is not coming from him. If he abide in me, and my words abide in you. If he abide in me, let's be straightforward. If I abide in Christ, I'm not going to commit adultery. And if I go out, and I live in adultery, I live in fornication, for those of us who are not married, I live in sin. And I say, well, after all, I know the methods. And every night I come back to God saying, oh God, forgive me, I've committed another sin again. The church will not grow. Because you cannot fight a civil war and a foreign war all at the same time. You have so much war you are fighting with sin with the flesh in your own life. It's difficult to fight Satan for the congregation and let the church grow. Abide in me. That means abide in a holy living. That means there will be no adultery. That means there will be no fornication. It's unfortunate when the ministry of gospelers is stained with the sin of immorality. Now, there were many shortcomings of the apostles. Many. Many shortcomings of those apostles. But one thing you will never find out among those apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ is immorality. Never. They didn't understand Gentiles coming to the church and being the same as the Jews. God was patient with them in telling them that there is one body, the Jews and the Gentiles. They didn't understand that it was unnecessary to keep the law of Moses for you to be saved. And they had to have a conference together. And he said, why put a yoke upon these people, which our fathers were not able to bear? It was difficult for them. They were slow in the perception, in the understanding of the Gentiles coming into the church without having to keep the law of Moses. But they understood that adultery and fornication must not be once named among the saints of God. Not once. And so if ye abide in me and I abide in you, then you will bear fruit. You know, it's possible to get out of this place and say, now we've got all the methods, now we've got all, all the techniques, now we've got all the know-how, now we've got all the uh, principles of church growth. Now we're going to get out and we're going to get the work done. Are you not surprised to hear that in some conferences that people have gone outside Nigeria, outside Nigeria, a particular conference, there were some people that were arrested among those ministers in the bank. Arrested in the bank. Now, those people that were arrested in the bank, having their name on the registration of a conference going on, international conference then he'll go back from that conference how can they bear fruit think about it and if we go for conferences and conferences and conferences and yet we would not abide in Christ we cannot bear fruit but if he abide in me and I in you You know, when you make up your mind that this work of the Lord is going to prosper in your hand, you will sacrifice anything. 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 That this work must prosper. And it takes abiding in Christ and the words of Christ abiding in you. Then it says, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Now, on that platform, that by the grace of God, in the strength of the Lord, we're going to do everything God wants us to do. I want to talk to you on using the discovered axe head. In 2 Kings chapter 6, 2 Kings 
chapter 6, from verse 1. And the sons of the prophet said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight, too small for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. Go ye. That's like New Testament. And thank God we have this commission to go ye. Now, the church to grow. What are the essentials of growth? What are the things that are common? Whatever our denomination, whatever our church affiliation, whatever our ministry, whatever our name, what are the things that are common before I can grow? One, I must be dissatisfied with my present attainment, with my present level. The sons of the prophet said unto Elisha, they said, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too small for us. They were dissatisfied with the small place. And we will not grow if we are not dissatisfied with the present level. You started, we started for five years. Have you covered even the stage where you started? You must be dissatisfied with the slow progress. You have started for 10 years. Have you covered all the states in a particular region? Like if you started, let's say, in a Yoruba-speaking section. Have you covered all the Yoruba states even now? Have you covered all the southern states even now? Have you got pastors and sent them out to all these various locations now, starting after 10 years? Or maybe you've started and now you've gone far, up to 20 years. Have you gone to the Republic of Benin? Have you gone into West African countries? Are you reaching out? Or are you just saying, no, this is enough for me. The money that these people contribute, the, the money is enough for me to feed. And I don't, want, I don't want too large church. Small church, small problem. Big church, big problem. I don't want to trouble myself. If we have that attitude, how are we going to grow? But dissatisfaction with the present attainment. Number two, the desire for increase. If we're going to grow, there must be a desire within us that we want to grow, we want to increase. And he said, let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam. Now, do you know that Church growth is cooperative job. It's a job, it's a work we do all together. Let us go, not let me go. You have other pastors in your church, that is in your, in your large denomination. And the desire within you, when we talk about growth, we're not just talking about this branch alone growing. But my brothers and sisters, if a branch will only grow by 50 members in six months. If we have, let's say, 20 branches, and we can plan that it is a growth for everyone, let us grow, let us grow. All these things that you have learned, the cassettes you have listened to, now it is not only for you, the cassettes you have bought, you can lend out to another pastor. He has not been in the conference. You cannot say, well, if you needed it, it should have come. Why don't you just know that we're talking about the church in Nigeria growing, not just your own branch, other branches. Let us go and let us go and let us grow that you will share with them. And it is possible that as we're here, we've been seeing one another and 
another person's church has even been growing before we came to this conference. Why can't we say, brother, if you have time, can you come over to my church also and just help? So that this interaction, this working together will help your church to grow, will help my church to grow. Let us go and take every man a beam now in your own local church. Every person in your church has something to contribute to make the church grow. Everyone. A desire for increase. And also, number three, a willingness to work hard. If the church is going to grow, there must be a willingness within me to work hard, to spend time, to put my resources and my talent into that church growing. Now, please, I'll say something that may look to you as if I was telling you to be selfish. But listen, I am married. You are married. Of course, I desire that you should have children. But I too, as a married man, I want to have children. And that's not selfishness. Is that selfishness? And if I have married and I don't have children, I will pray, I will fast, I will check up, perhaps I will consult the doctor and say, what's the problem? What's the matter? Even though now, if somebody tells me that, why are you worried? I am your senior brother, I have children. I am your junior sister, I have children. And I am a fellow member of the same church as you are, I have children. If you want to find where to spend money and send children to school, I have so many of them, I can, you can send them to school for me. No, you are not happy with that. You say, even though my senior brother has children, my junior sister has children, church members have children, I want to have my own children. The same thing with church. You have left all. And you have committed your life into the church and into the building of the kingdom of God with Christ. Even though we are growing, other people are growing, other people are growing, you too, you desire to grow on your own. That's why it's important that you will look into it and see into it that your church in particular, it's growing. And then you share with other people too that they can grow. You know, even in our society, even among sinners and unbelievers, if we have a large family and all the people, the members of that family, they're getting married and all of them are having children except this fellow, then all the other people in the family, you know what they do? They advise him, they counsel him, they help him, they push him, they draw him, so that he too, except there's a problem in that family, he too will, will have children. Isn't that what we do? We recommend doctors for him, we recommend somebody who can pray for him, we recommend to him, so that he can grow. That's what we should do in the body of Christ. That if my church is growing, your church is growing, and we see a fellow minister, his church is not growing, we advise him, we counsel him, we pray with him, we give him materials so that his church will grow. It's something we do cooperatively together. So there is willingness to work hard and spend time and pour our talents and resources into it. Then there must be wisdom and humility to work together. The wisdom and the humility to work together. Now, when they wanted to do that, and they wanted to expand and extend and make the place grow, Elisha said, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. Do you know that in our churches growing, we have the privilege of continued support and supervision? It's a privilege. Elisha said, you can go. Now I release you. Go and take beams and go and cut down the wood. And as you, as you do that, build and let the place grow. And then one of them said, won't you go with us? I attended a conference in 1983. Conference for evangelists. International conference for itinerant evangelists organized by Billy Graham, and the Lord used him in a mighty way. And he brought speakers and counselors from 
almost all over the world. And they provided counseling for us. And I saw one of the counselors and consultants. And he sat down with me, very patient, very loving. And he was evangelical. That is, he just believed that you get saved and that's all you need. Because that's all he knew. And he wanted to counsel me on administration, organization, and how the church will grow. And how all these things that they were teaching us in the conference, I'll be able to uh, apply them. And I saw it was evangelical. And I said, before we get into the counseling session, that I want to tell you that I am Pentecostal. I believe in the baptism in the Holy Spirit and healing and all that. Would you still mind to give me the best of the counseling you can ever give to anybody, though you know I'm Pentecostal and you are evangelical? He smiled and said, I appreciate your forthrightness. I appreciate your, the way you are clear, plain, and frank, and that's how I am everywhere. And I told him, this is who I am, Pentecostal. But I, I know that though I'm Pentecostal, you know organization, you know administration, you know what I'm looking for, you have it. Would you mind giving it to me? And you know, instead of spending 30 minutes with me, he spent one hour and told me to come back the second day and spent almost another hour. But one point is this. I came back home. All those things that we were taught, I tried to apply them. Organization, administration, how to have a crusade, how to do the follow-up, how to get this done and how to get that done. But... The conference had stopped. There was no continued support and supervision. And that man had counseled me. That was the end. When I got into difficulty here of how to reorganize, how to get this done, how to get that done, I had to do that all by myself. When I heard there was going to be another conference, then I wrote to them quickly. I said, I benefited in 1983, but I want to come back because I didn't get everything. And also, I want to bring all our ministers who have them in Nigeria. I just want to bring them to that conference. You know the letter they wrote to me? They said, they now want to expose the thing to those who have never come before. We're sorry, there's no chance for you. I wrote again. But they said, we're sorry. That all that you got in 1983... Teach them. Good luck to you. And our ministers, they were not able to have the privilege and the chance. But if that opportunity could be given and created, that's why we say this single conference, it's not enough. Or you think it's enough? No. Now, if that counselor, if that person that knew everything about the church growth and, and the administration, if he could have continued with me, how I would have made less mistakes. You heard yesterday as I was talking to the church, one of the mistakes I made in the past. Now in the church, they know that in administration, in organization, I tell them, if something was wrong in the past and now I want to change it, I tell them, I was wrong in the past. That doesn't mean I was a sinner. It only, may, it only means that once I was a child, now I'm growing. That's the meaning. If, there is a, if I've been acting to the workers in a particular way before and I see that I was wrong, that doesn't mean that I was committing sin. When I was a child, I behaved as a child. Now that I'm a man, I behave like a man. And I come to the church and I say now, church, listen. How many of you will still forgive the pastor after you have seen one of his mistakes? Then they laugh. While they are laughing, then I give them the thing. I said, now this is what we are going to do. And they are all happy. Because they know it's not a sin that a person did not know how to preach in a crusade, didn't know how to organize, how to make the publicity. And that's how we have been going on. That's how we have been going on. And whenever they are wrong, then I rebuke them. Because whenever I am wrong and there's a mistake, I tell them, even though they laugh about it. And then when they are wrong too, I laugh 
I laugh uh, with them and I say, but now this one is wrong, this one is wrong. And that's how we have been going on. But the point is, when I wanted to make all these changes and reorganization and this and that, I didn't have any help from the conferences I had gone. That's because of the lack I have seen. That's why I said in this conference, it's not just going to be a week conference. That's why we have got all your names and addresses, and by the grace of God, we'll be sending articles on church growth to you yeah. as the thing is going on. And then also, when you have any problem, you try to put it into practice, then you can write uh, to the uh, church aid ministries, and the address is there on the outline that now you taught us this, you taught us this, I'm having this difficulty. And if you write like that, if it is something that I can deal with through another person, we send another person, go and help us look into that and deal with it. In fact, not only on preaching, because if you are going to, if you are going to grow, you need expansion, physical expansion. And if there are difficulties, you write and you say, now, I have difficulty. I want to build a church in this place. Now, you are not asking us to bring all the money that you, you know, that you will use. But if you want us to help in the construction of the building that is drawing or this or giving you ideas, giving you ideas. Now, that's how, how, we, how we receive help. I was in Singapore uh, just uh, last month. And apart from all the preaching, I saw buildings there. And I called uh, the pastor there. I said, now before I go, can you introduce me to an architect? Because in our church, we're growing. And the people are sitting outside. You saw them yesterday. Even on Monday for Bible study. Though they came on Sunday, just uh, the previous day, on Monday for Bible study, you saw how the place was. I said, we need to build a bigger building. Now, from the things I, I've seen here, I see that you may have architects. And he is the pastor of that place. And he said that um, he himself can tell me and teach me everything I want to know about building. He studied mathematics in the university. And then he, after studying mathematics, he taught before he came into the full-time ministry. And he, he knows a lot about drawing, about, you know, all these things because of his experience in the past. We sat down together until about one o'clock in the night. And all the drawings he made for me and all the sketches, I packed everything. And I brought them to Nigeria. And I'm still to, to sit down and discuss with our architect that, you know, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this. If others are doing it for me, I should be able to do it for you. Amen. So that's why helps that are needed. Because we can't do it alone. Church growth is so wide. Church growth is so broad. That if you want the church to grow, and you really want to apply yourself to hard work, it's necessary that there is this cooperation, continued support and supervision of the work. You know, we are planning... Um, the crusade in Lagos in 1985. The crusade you saw on the screen. And I sat down. All that they taught us at the um, International Conference for Itinerant Evangelists, I brought everything together, brought all our leaders together. I said, now we must have this crusade. How do we get the permission? How do we do this? How do we do that? You think if Billy Graham had given me uh, his word, in 1983, and he had said, anywhere you want to have a crusade, whether in Ghana, or in Kenya, or in Zambia, anywhere, or in London, write to me. If I'm not able to uh, help you myself, I'll send one of our experienced people, and he'll come and help you. I would have written to them in 1985, saying, the opportunity has come. What you told me, send the person now. But there was no promise like that. But here we are saying that the church growth we want, we have, this conference is not just for theory. It's not just for lecture. That we must have continued support and continued supervision by the grace of God. Amen. I told you before that we sent 35 from Deepalai Bible Church, from all over Nigeria to um, 
Korea. The pastor there is Yonggi Cho. Now his church is 500,000. That's the population of Port Harcourt, the whole church. They have seven services on one Sunday. Seven. And he has thousands and thousands of house fellowship leaders. I think by now they must have more than 40,000 house fellowship leaders. And as we sent uh, these um, our ministers there, in, in his preaching, he said he can build a church of at least 10,000 in any city in the whole world. He can build a church of at least 10,000 in every city. But our preachers came back. All their churches now, well, I didn't go. My own church is more than 10,000. But those who went, their churches now, they are not yet up to 10,000. And if he could have given us a promise that if you are finding difficult, if you are having difficulty on doing it, I said I can do it, and I can do it with the people that I've been working with here in Korea. If you have any difficulty, send to us and we'll give you help. Oh, I would have written to him long, long ago. But there's no provision like that. It is because of what I know I needed before, which I couldn't get from those who were planning church growth conferences. That is the reason we have planned this, so that what I didn't get, which I have discovered myself, I'll be able to give to other people. So that means then that this church growth is not ending today. The conference is still continuing. And there is going to be continued support and continued supervision. Now, suppose Elisha had not gone with these people. When they said, be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servant. And he answered, I will go. He was willing to help. And what a great privilege. If there is this provision of continued support and supervision. That's why last night we put those forms in your hand. To ask you what you want. To ask you what you feel that we can do more than just this week's conference. So that we can still contribute more. And I believe that as we carry out, we're going to look into those forms. We're going to see all that you have written there. And we're going to analyze everything. In fact, if I could, um, if I could have done it, what I would have done would have been to take your files and sit down. And go through those files and see your goals, your aspirations, your ambition, and your plans. And then, if it were possible to call you one by one, to go through those files and say, this thing you put here, how do you want to achieve it? How do you want to do this? That's why, because we couldn't go through all the files, you know the files I mean, the files in your hand. That's why we gave you the final form to be filled in duplicate. That's what's your goal? What, how many branches do you have now? How many members are there? What is your plan for the end until December 1987? How do you intend to reach this plan? And by the grace of God, we'll be going through all the things, the ones who have submitted. We we'll want you to keep a duplicate so that when you go back home, you'll be saying, this is what I've written down. This is what I've said. And you'll be able to ask questions and write to us if there is any hitch, if there is any problem as to getting those things done. And I believe that with this plan, if we diligently follow it, our churches are going to grow in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in verses 4 and 5, Elisha went for them. But then the axe head was lost. The real thing they needed, it was lost. So he went with them. And when they came to Jordan, they cut down the wood. But as one of as one was felling a beam, cutting a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. Axe head was lost. How was it lost? Work without watchfulness will lose the axe head. I work and work and work, but there's no watchfulness. No watchfulness. The axe head may be lost. 
zeal without knowledge the axe head may be lost faith without fellowship with others of like precious faith the axe head may be lost power without purity the axe head may be lost vision without obedience to the god of revelation the axe head may be lost you remember Samson and the lost power Samson had no friend trusted friend co-minister with whom to share his heart he was a lone ranger and the lone ranger loses many significant things he'll never regain the one that says i'll do it alone i'll walk alone i'll tread the path alone i'll evangelize alone i can do it all alone by myself have you ever wondered about judas iscariot among all the 12 disciples, there was no intimate, close friend with him. He had none. He was a lone ranger. Even when Jesus was saying, that thing you do, uh, do it in time, nobody knew the meaning of what Jesus was saying. He never opened up his heart to anybody. Judas Iscariot. From the beginning to the end. From the time he came to the time he left. Never. Have you ever wondered how Rehoboam lost the kingdom after Solomon committed, after Solomon uh, committed everything to his son and then Solomon went away, Solomon died. All the elders that could have held, they told him, Rehoboam, you are a young fellow. These elders that have come to you, if you will tell them you will be their servants, who will serve them in humility, you will have the whole nation together under you. He said, okay, you can go. He called the young, young people, the bus conductors, the one that never sleeps at home at night, the one that have parents, but they never accept the authority and the control of the parents, the people that don't know anything about life, ruffians. He called them and said, these people have come to me and this is what they said and they said blow it up tell them you are not a man like that that your thumb will be thicker than the waist of your father tell them he beat them with ordinary scourge ordinary whip i'm going to beat you with scorpion you know pastors like that they are the Lord, they are the all in all. They are terrific, they are bold, but they are violent and aggressive. They tell the church, I will not take nonsense from anyone in this church. I scourge you and beat you a scorpion. Then they are going to run away from your church and run to the church of another pastor that is applying the principles of church growth. And that's how he lost the United Kingdom. But how are we going to do it? So that we don't lose what the Lord has started. Work, but watch. Have zeal, but have knowledge with it. Have vision, but be obedient to the God of revelation. Have faith, but remain in fellowship. Have power, but together with purity. The axe head was lost. I've discovered that no matter what good ideas I have, it's so easy to lose them. I'm not talking of salvation. I'm not talking of backsliding. 
I'm talking about a pastor that has good, good, good ideas about church growth. And eventually, if he doesn't watch, if he's not using wisdom, if he's not marrying and merging the knowledge with the zeal, if he's not in constant fellowship with other people that their churches are growing, if he's a lone ranger, I'm not talking about backsliding and, not, and going away from the Lord, still remaining in the church and in the work and yet not being able to have the zeal, the power and the fervency and the pungency to keep the church growing, that eventually you have lost the possibility and the ability to get that work done. The axe head is lost. The significant thing that will make the church to grow, it's lost. Just like we were discussing the other night, we watched the video. I read of minister after minister, evangelist after evangelist, that at one time, they were doing great things for the Lord. And yet, even though they were doing those great things for the Lord, a time came that they were not as effective anymore. I was a minister that I read about. Somebody had a demon possession. Terrible, terrible demon possession. And he had the Bible school at that time, that minister. And he, he had the power of God. He was having this crusade. And it about, at about 5, 4.30 in the evening, there was a woman that had this demon case. It was terrible. It was terrible. And eight Bible school students, they held Bibles in their hands. And they'll say, come out in Jesus' name. And they'll tap that a woman with the Bible and run back. Because that woman wanted to just grab one of them and tear the person into pieces. And, they'll, they'll go, and eight of them, they surrounded the woman. And many people were holding that uh, woman. And they'll tap her with the Bible and say, in Jesus' name, come out. In Jesus' name, come out. The eight of them going and coming and coming like that. And this evangelist. I don't want to tell you his name because of the bad thing that happened later, but when things were good, when things were at the height, when the power was overflowing, when the faith was sharp and clear, he was coming. And these Bible school students, eight of them, they had labored and labored and labored. They were almost tired now. And this evangelist just went near that woman. And whispered in the ears and said, I am the evangelist in charge of this crusade. I have arrived. And the demons went out. No prayer. But authority, faith, and power. But, my brothers and sisters, when you are in crusades and you are preaching, you are away from home, your wife not there, your children not there, co-workers with you not there, you are careless, you live alone, you walk alone, you move alone. Eventually, because of the tiredness and the frustrations and even though the miracles and many things were happening, he started drinking little by little. And eventually, he lost his ministry. Not only that, he lost the respect of many people, the whole nation, not here in Nigeria. And he lost his life eventually. Keep in close contact with other ministers of like precious faith. The journey is too long for you to walk alone. The work is too great for you to labor alone. They lost, that man lost the accent, but thank God there was Elisha around. And he said, alas, my master, because it was borrowed. And in verse 6, and the man of God said, where fell it? And he showed him the place. And he caught down his stick and cast it thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore said he, take it up to thee. And he put his hand and took it, and the work can continue again. How many times 
I have felt many years ago so tired, thinking I don't know if I can still go on a step further. But thank God, because of the fellowship of people of like precious faith, because of the encouragement of other people. You know, sometimes, in fact, after the crusade we had in 1985, the times of preaching, the times of waiting upon the Lord, the times of the exertion, the preaching, the tiredness, the dryness, after you have spoken and ministered and you have shouted and you have lost your voice, you have lost almost everything except the fact, except the fact that you know that God is with you, but your emotions, your feelings, everything completely dry. That if you depended upon emotion, you'll wonder, what have I done? And I felt that before we have another crusade, uh, it will take a long, long time. Because just that one, it was too much. And yet, because there are other people around, all these, uh, our state overseers, and they were saying, no partiality, Lagos have had, as I did, you must come to Ibadan. No partiality. Lagos has said it. You must come to Calabar. You must come to Ilorin. You must come to Enugu. You must come to Imo State. And um, I kept on uh, saying, well, we will do it. And they will say, when? Well, I would say having a crusade, uh, you know, is so tiring. It's uh, so burdensome. Oh, they will say, we're all praying for you. And they were praying. And our people here in Lagos were praying. Now what could I have done? A young man as I am. What could I have done without the prayer support of all those people in the church? And all over Nigeria. Their prayer. Their support. Their encouragement. They overlook my mistakes and they appreciate the things that the Lord is doing. That's what is keeping us going. And I wouldn't have been able to continue without the pool and the drawing of these uh, brethren at Ibadan were to have a crusade. And um, eventually it was cancelled. Was I sad? I was neutral. Why was I neutral? I was asking myself, was I even ready for a crusade like that before? Can I go through all that again? Because we had one in, uh, in December, in Lagos, and we are to have this one in April. But our brethren, you will be surprised. In Lagos, and everyone, they started going out, they said, no, deeper life crusade cancelled, impossible. And they came to me and they quoted the promises I had repeated to them so many times. And they said, with God, all things are possible. And I said, yes. And it went around, and eventually they came to me from Ibadan, and they said, now the commissioner has said we should apply again. I said, is that so? And uh, the brother said, yes. And we applied, and they said we should come. And we went. And what I saw in that crusade is more than what I saw in Lagos. And then Enugu. And then this year, in Imo State, Oweri, and then in Benue State, Makodi. But many of those things, I tell you the fact, and I tell the church, some of those things I wouldn't even be able to do if it were not for the fact that sometimes some of these leaders will hold my hand spiritually and they'll drag me along and say, the time is now, we must do it now. And because of the cooperation, you need that cooperation too. You need that encouragement too. And among your own ministers, as well as among ministers of other churches, and from us here too, if we can lend any help in hand, if we can help you in any way, if you are going through any problem in your church growth, it is likely that we would have gone the pro through the problem before. And we can easily tell you, brother, what you are going through, we went through before, and by the grace of God, this is how we handled it. And I pray that our lost axe head will come up again.
we have discovered them. We are discovering them already. And as we go back, we are going to use everything that we have learned. Don't just pack all these notes and put them somewhere. Use what you have heard. Use what you have learned. Because it's only as we use them that our churches will grow. And we're going to use them. Don't worry about making mistakes. If you don't make a mistake, you'll never make any other thing. You must make mistakes. If you don't make mistakes, I'll be surprised. Look at that child learning how to eat. He'll put the food at the cheek. Put the food on the cloth. Put the food on the ground. But he goes on doing it. He goes on doing it. Of course, he'll make mistakes. But now, by a few months, a few years, he'll know how to eat properly. Look at that child trying to walk. He'll rise up. He'll fall. He'll rise up and fall. Of course, he'll make mistakes. But he goes on doing it. And he'll walk perfectly. Look at that child that is trying to talk. And wants to call water. And calls it in another way. Of course, that's a mistake. But he goes on speaking, goes on speaking, goes on speaking. And eventually, he does it well. What are, what are you doing now that you didn't do bad before? If you are driving a car, think of the time you started driving. And the person was teaching you. But suppose he just gave you lectures for one week. Now, we we'll say, all of you that want to learn how to drive, come together into the driving school conference. Then this person comes and he says, now I'm going to talk on the steering. And that person comes and says, I'm going to talk about how to move your hand and set your eyes and avoid all that collision with other vehicles and give all the lectures, all the lectures, all the lectures and say, now goodbye, go home and go and drive. Does it work like that? No, but that driver, the, the driver that is training him, he stays on, stays on, stays on. And even when that person is staying with you, mistakes will be made. Now the person will say, ah, you want, to, you want to kill somebody. Look at how you wanted to, you almost got into the gutter. Then you come back again. And even when you are, after you have got your license, you are still driving with care. But you keep on driving, you keep on driving, you keep on driving until now you get into that vehicle, you can be talking and praying and thinking and yet driving. We learn by doing. Don't be afraid of mistakes. I pray that you will not fall. Amen. There's any mistake, there are ministers around you, call them. They'll pick you up. And our state overseers, they are busy, but I'm, I've been appealing to them since we came. You see that uh, I've been calling them after we meet here, then I call them, I say, now remember, we must help our fellow ministers. I keep on saying it, keep on saying it. I say it that way because I've learned that until I say something six times, different, different angles, before many people will catch it. That's what they teach us in communication. So I call them that, brothers, let's keep on helping our fellow ministers. Let's keep on helping our fellow ministers. And if you get into any difficulty, you're not able to, you know, do this or do that, it's likely that some of the things you are getting into, some of them might have gone into these things before, and they'll be able to help. And if it's beyond them, then they'll be in contact with me. And by the grace of God, as time will permit, and I'm depending upon your prayers as well, then I'll be able to see either to write to you or to, or to offer help one way or the other. And I believe that this work will be done. Amen. We're not talking about just a single denomination. We're talking about evangelizing Nigeria Amen. and evangelizing Africa. Amen. And by the grace of God, it's going to be done. You have discovered the axe head. Make sure that from now you put it to use, you are using the axe head. We'll rise up and we're going to pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you because it's because we know that we ought to move 
from where we are presently. And that's the reason we are in this conference. We have a desire that the work of the Lord will succeed in our hands. But Father, we pray, according to your word, that if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to every man liberally. And God is not stingy to give us the wisdom. Father, we ask that this wisdom you will give us in Jesus' name. Amen. The wisdom you gave to the sons of the prophets. To be able to say to another person to come to help. The wisdom you give to a man that is sinking. To ask somebody who can swim to come and help. Father, we pray. That the same wisdom in the kingdom of God to cooperatively, to jointly do this work successfully, give to us in Jesus' name Amen. the humility to ask questions, the humility of a baby to be able to ask, Where is the way? to be able to ask, How do I do it? without minding the things that we have achieved in the past, to still be able to willing to ask questions, that humility, give to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Not counting our titles, not counting our place, not counting who we are, but to be humble, like the Lord Jesus Christ, who counted it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation but humbled himself, became a man, and died the death of a criminal. Father, there is no death that is so deep, there is no loneliness that is so deep, than the Lord Jesus has shown us. And by that, he was exal exalted, and given a name above every name, that at that name every knee should bow. Father, the same humility, the same depth of humility, give to us ministers in Jesus' name. Amen. The word of God says that he giveth grace to the humble. Amen. And Father, we pray that this humility, we will humble ourselves. Amen. We pray that God will not humble us, but we ourselves will humble ourselves. Amen. That your grace, abundant grace, will fall upon every one of us. Amen. Help us in this journey. Amen. Equip us more and more, O oh God. Amen. And help us to do all those things that we have learned and had, and we will remember them to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. We know you've answered our prayers. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.